Hello and welcome to another Incarnate Livestream. My name is Mati and today we're going to be creating taverns or a tavern with a fantasy battle map style. And we're going to be doing quite a few things in this stream. We're going to be showing you how to do layouts, how to quickly populate a room, a little bit about architecture, and how to make stackable floors, etc, etc. A lot more, so stick around, okay? A lot we're going to be covering. Now before we kind of jump into this, just one real quick announcement. And that is that we just released some new art, not a whole lot, just a little bit, just this new tavern art. We're basically just adding to uh, the new, the pre-existing tavern pack and just added some new stuff to it. You'll be seeing every single one of these in the map that we'll be creating. All right. Now you're gonna to wanna to clone and edit this map if you wanna follow along in today's stream. If you're watching on Twitch, you can find that in the chat. If you're going to be watching on YouTube, you can find that in the video description, okay? All right, we're going to load it up and we're going to get started. Now, for a lot of people, it's kind of difficult to do architecture, to do layouts. Thankfully, in Incarnate, you don't have to be an architect to do layouts or floor plans. You just need to know a method or a, um, a <laughs> method or a uh, order of operation to make it a little bit easier for you. Hey, first time chatters, welcome both of you. Glad that you're here. We're making a tavern, all right? And we're gonna, I'm gonna be teaching you a lot of stuff today, so I'm really excited about this. You know, a tavern is where a lot of adventures begin, a lot of fun stuff going on, a lot of quests, a lot of campaigns can start in a tavern, and no matter where you are in your campaign, you always end up in a tavern one way or another. So learning to make a tavern is absolutely important. Okay. Now, as always, it's always hard to get started when you're doing, when you're making um, a map, especially the floor plans, because where, where, where do I start with this? And like I said, you don't have to be an architect. All you have to do is just have a certain method and so that that way it's easy for you every time. And every time that I enact this order of operation, this method, I get better and better at it and so will you, okay? Hey, first time chatter, glad that you are here, welcome. Yeah, awesome, first time stream for you, great. So let's talk about pre-planning. Now the first thing that I do when I make any kind of structure or any kind of building, I always write down a list of the rooms that will be inside of the building. So you've got, because it's a tavern and an inn, it's gonna have rooms, 11 total. And one of those is obviously gonna be the owner or the barkeep's room. There's gonna be a dining hall where patrons can go and congregate. There's gonna be a kitchen. A pantry, if you're not sure what a pantry is, a pantry is like a place where you store dry foods. A privy, and we're going to have two of them. A privy is basically a bathroom. You're also going to have a buttery, and a buttery is basically where you store or make beer. There's obviously going to be a grain storage, and there's going to be a secret room because I kind of feel that every structure should have one secret room, right? It's just a staple, right? There's always some mysterious secret room that's got something in it, right? Now, once you've made the list of rooms, you have to start thinking about the number of floors that you have. Now, the more rooms that you have, obviously, the more floors you're going to have. And the one thing that I mentioned is that we're going to be doing stackable floors. It would be really, really hard to put 19 rooms all on one floor. That's a lot of work, right? So instead, we're going to do multiple floors. Now, where you determine where rooms are on certain floors, it depends on the function of the room and proximity to the other rooms. So what that means is that obviously you wouldn't have the kitchen upstairs with the rooms or you wouldn't have the privy in the kitchen, right? So, But you would have the pantry and, and the kitchen close to each other, right? And you would have the buttery and the grain storage together, right? And you would have the privy, the privy in near the down, down dining hall, so that when people had a bad day, had a bad night of drinking, they can go to the bathroom, right? So it's absolutely important to think about what the function of each room is, and then that will decide the proximity to those other rooms. So let's go ahead and open up planning here. Let's talk about the floors that we're going to be working with. So on that, on the in the cellar, we're going to have what's the grain storage, the buttery, and the secret room because I kind of feel like a cellar is a good place for a secret room. On the ground floor, you're gonna have the dining hall, the kitchen, the pantry, and the privy. That all makes sense, right? And then the rooms are gonna be on an upper floor. That's gonna be that first floor. So a total of three different levels, starting at the very bottom level, which is under the ground, the cellar, the ground floor, 
which is level with the ground and that first floor, okay? Now what really helps me, once I've kind of gotten that figured out, once I have that list and I figured out all the rooms, I make a little diagram for myself. And these diagrams are really easy to make. It's just the path tool, white path. And then I filled in um, the white paths with just a rug that I put all the way to zero brightness, so it's pure black. And let's go take a look at this diagram here. I'm gonna show you some interesting things that you can do to make it a little bit easier for you when you're putting things together. The first thing that you're gonna notice is, is that I've got two different views here. I've got that side view where you can see the roof, the first floor, the ground floor, and there's what's called a pop-out. If you're not familiar with what a pop-out is, a pop-out is basically a room or a section of the house that pops out from the main room, okay, or from the main body of the house. And the reason why I like to use pop-outs is because is, is that you don't really want your building to look like a giant shoebox. That looks really weird. If it was just this shape right here, it kind of just looks like a shoebox with a roof, right? And that doesn't look good. So a pop out like this kitchen right here is a good element to add to get a little bit of extra detail, a little bit of depth. It makes your building look a little, have a little more dimension and it looks more interesting. You'll notice in the other view that there's a pop out right here as well, which is called the privy. That's where your bathrooms are. So those pop outs are really nice to give a little bit of extra dimension to your structures because you really don't want them to look like a shoebox. That just doesn't look right. Now you don't have to make these side view diagrams when you're making your maps, but I use them myself because I find that they're helpful on trying to figure out where things are. So it's just a little extra guide for myself and I'm using it for you to see what the overall idea is that we're gonna be doing for this. Hey, first time ch chatter, welcome, glad that you are here. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. There's got to be a secret wall that hides a small room. I totally agree. Great idea. Okay, let's jump into the first part, and that's working on a blueprint. And I'm going to start with the ground floor, because the ground floor is the floor that your players are going to walk into first, and it's also got the access to the stairs that go up to the first floor, where the rooms are, and it also has access to the cellar. So let me show you where those access points are. Right here, you have stairs that lead upstairs to, to the rooms. And then you also have this stair in the kitchen that goes down to the cellar. Now, it makes sense to have the entrance to the cellar in the kitchen because that's where the buttery is. That's where the grain storage is. So it only makes sense to have that there. So when you think about access to certain rooms, you need to think about its proximity to the other rooms and the function that those rooms have. That's what's really going to help you out. So again, the stairs that are going to be right by the pantry goes to the first floor. The stairs in the kitchen goes down into the cellar. You're also going to notice that there's an entrance. This is how people get into it. And in the main room, and now when you're doing your, um, when you're doing your layouts or your blueprints, I always start with the largest room first. Because the dining hall is the largest room, it's going to have all these tables. It's going to have um, a place to sit, places to sit. It's going to have a fireplace to keep people warm. All of those things are going to be in the dining hall. So you start, when you're doing your floor plan, you start with the largest room first, right? And remember those pop-outs? Here's that first pop-out, the kitchen right here and it's popped out because now it's now you're not taking up all this room on the first floor in the dining hall because you've created a pop out you've now created room for people to travel through the dining hall and it's not too tight because the problem with trying to fit every single room on one floor is that even if you resize the map it's going to rescale the stamps down so whenever you make a map larger or or resize it to be larger, what you're really doing is changing the aspect ratio and causing the stamps to get to scale down. So there comes a certain point where you've scaled it so down, you've resized it so big that even in like a 4K editing resolution, even the 10, size 10, size 20, they get kind of blurry and hard to see. And it's really hard to work with because not everyone can work in 4 or 3K editing. A lot of users are going to be working in 2K. And so to avoid that scaling issue, to avoid that blurriness, don't resize your map. Just create multiple floors. And that's so much better than trying to resize everything. Now, the other pop out is this privy up here. And of course, you've got access from the dining hall 
right into the privy. Because, you know, like I said, you had a bad night. Maybe you had a couple beers. You got to make it over to that privy, right? And then the last little pop out right here is going to be where the fireplace section is. We'll call it a fireplace alcove. And that's where the fireplace and some fireplace seating is going to be, okay? So that's our first. That's really going to be our ground floor. Let's go ahead and move down into um, the cellar so we can see what we're doing. So we're going to be taking, we're going to be going through the kitchen and going down these stairs right here. And so down the stairs we go and into the cellar. Let me go ahead and just turn off this ground floor blueprint. And if you're wondering how I made the blueprints, exact same thing, white path and rugs that are brightness at zero. And then I just fit them within the lines. Okay. Let's look at the cellar blueprint. Okay, there are the stairs at, on the right side there. See, here is the staircase. Oopsie, let me undo that real quick. My mistake. I did not mean to do that. Oopsie, let's get back to that cellar here. All right. All right, so here's your cellar. All right, so you have the stairs that go down into the cellar or go back up to the kitchen, of course. We've also got our grain storage. And I'm thinking that the secret room can be accessed through the grain storage. So either there can be like a secret lever or there can be a button or a panel on and, uh, on the wall that you have to push and it will open up th the doors or open up into the secret room, okay? And then we'll talk about what we're gonna put in that secret room. Maybe we could stick with a theme like the weekly map prompts that we're doing, which would be Dragon's Rest. So maybe we can think about something like that. Of course, you can also do you have that, but you have your buttery. Okay, so all the buttery and the grain storage are all next to each other, easily accessed through the kitchen, go down, and then the secret room, which, hey, hush, hush, it's a secret, don't tell anybody, okay? Let's go ahead and turn off that cellar, and we'll go up to the next floor plan, and then we'll start showing you how to put walls together. So let me go to the cellar here, turn this off. Let's go with our first floor blueprint. Okay. Now I've done something different with this first floor that's above the, the main dining hall and that you're gonna notice right here that there's this kind of rectangle right here. This is actually an opening in the floor that lets you look down. So those are technically where that red is, those are banisters, and you can look down and see people who are on the ground floor. And the reason why I'm doing that is not also does it look cool, but also because heat can more easily rise up and heat up these other rooms. Because, hey, in medieval times, it was freezing cold. There was no central heating and cooling at the time. So fire was the only way to keep yourself warm. So this opening in the center where those banisters are is a perfect way to allow the heat to rise up and keep those rooms nice and warm. Now that's purely function, but the aesthetic is it also looks really interesting because who doesn't like it being on a top floor and then looking down and seeing the people doing their commuting, doing their thing, right? So that's nice to have there. Now I wanna talk about what happens when you have a floor that has a lot of rooms and what can happen is an access problem. When you have a lot of rooms, it'd be kind of awkward if I had to travel to three through three rooms to get to another room. That would be really weird, right? <laughs> Who knows what you're walking in on, right? So instead, you need to create what's called a hallway. This is a wraparound hallway. This stair goes down, downstairs, goes downstairs into the ground floor while if you go up the stairs it goes into this hallway right here and it wraps around and stops up against right here which is a wall okay so there's a wraparound hallway you always want to think about access okay you don't want to put a room right in the center where people need to get to somewhere else so always think about access points a hallway is always number one especially in a tavern because there's so many rooms and it'd be really difficult to find you have to come up with a layout that allows access to all those rooms so that that way everyone in those rooms still has their privacy right so that wraparound hallway is going to work absolutely perfect. Hey, first time chatter deck one bell. So glad that you're here. Yeah, you know what? When it comes to making floor plans, you have to think about both function and fantasy. Because if it's just purely function, why are you using it in D&D? D&D's &D? got gorgons, flaming fireballs, 
<sighs> Walking Dead, you name it. So a little bit of fantasy mixed with function. And function is important because, hey, if function is what's recognizable, it's going to make sense. And that will trick the user or the viewer to say, yeah, that makes sense. And then throw in the fantastical element as well. So we'll be going over that. We'll throw in some fantasy elements once we start populating the room with stamps, okay? I'm going to go ahead and turn off the first floor floor plan and just jump right into uh, the, the, the ground floor here. So I'm going to turn this on. Okay, now with when it comes to a ground floor, when you come with these floors, the first thing I like to do, like I said, is when you're making these walls is to start with a rectangle first. So really, you just need to make this section of the wall first. Okay, once you've made that section of the wall, you just need to copy and paste and then just flip and rotate like this. Okay, so it's very, very helpful to do the copy and paste. We have not implemented the room tool yet, and but we are working on it. I'm very excited for the room tool, but we haven't implemented it. And when we do, making this stuff is gonna be a hundred times easier, but for now, we're just gonna go with the copy and paste method. Okay, now you just need to do that with every single room that you have, okay? Every single room. You just need to make that L shape, copy, paste, rotate, and that way you can start putting it together. Once you've made the main shape, you can start deleting pieces. You can start deleting some sections of wall to start putting in the pop out. So you can delete that section of the wall and then make the pop out, delete this section of the wall, make that pop out, delete the other section where the privy is, okay? So that's the fastest way that I know of to start putting your walls up is just make that first L shape, copy, paste, rotate, boom, done. It doesn't take too long at all, really. It just goes pretty quickly. So just copy and paste is really the fastest trick until we get that room tool. Now that we've got all that together, let's just identify where everything is. Remember, this is this entrance right here. There's the entrance. Here is the kitchen, and here is the privy, here is the pantry, and the staircases leading up to the ground, to the uh, first floor, the fireplace, and the stairs that go down to the cellar. Now, sometimes it can be kind of confusing where to start once you start, once you've finished all the walls, it can be kind of difficult to know how do I, where do I begin populating the room with stamps? And my suggestion is, is start with the largest stamps in the room first. And the reason why is because if you start with the largest stamps first, it will fill up the room quicker and it will allow you to look up what's called your flow of traffic. So let's go ahead and open up that ground floor and I'm going to turn on some some objects here. And the first one I like to start with is tables. Tables are the most iconic and the largest thing in the dining hall, right? Once you've put down those tables, you can start to see a flow of traffic. So obviously when you walk into the tavern, you'll be able to walk around the table, right? So nothing's obstructing that traffic. You'll be able to walk over into the privy. Okay, you'll be able to walk over to the fireplace unobstructed. You'll be able to get to the staircase unobstructed. You'll be able to walk to the bar right here. It's, it's access to, to the kitchen where that bar table is, right? So remember, flow of traffic is super important. Obviously, you don't want to stick a giant table right there in the entrance. How are they going to get in, right? No one wants to pole vault to get to their seat, okay? That is not going to work. So when you're placing down your largest objects, make sure that there is room for your players to walk around because pole vaulting just doesn't do any good, okay? Now, once I've added in that, then you can start putting down other things like your rugs. Rugs are fairly big, so you can throw down rugs. Let me take a look here. What do we got here? Uh-oh, what happened to all my pieces? Oh, there we go. Let's see here. Where are my rugs? Let's throw down rugs. And the reason why I recommend rugs is because they're also very large. So if I open them up, and where you place rugs is really up to you. But I totally recommend that they are on layer negative five. And the reason why is because nothing's going to be underneath a rug except for the floor, or maybe you want a little piece of paper with a note or something underneath that you want your players to find. But normally your rugs are going to be on layer negative five, okay? Because you want everything else to be on top of that, right? 
And where you place your rugs is up to you. There's no formula. I put a couple underneath the tables. In reality, I would never want a rug underneath a table because it'd be a pain in the butt to clean. But when it comes to aesthetics, rugs look nice. They look cool and they add a little bit of color and flavor. Notice how that floor is made of stone, but those rugs add a little bit of color and they allow those tables to pop out a little bit, right? So where you put your rugs is up to you, okay? Once you've done the rugs, you want to start putting things like your benches and your stools. And the one thing I recommend about your stools is, is that you want them to be a layer below the tables and you want them to be just a little bit darker than your table. And the reason why is because contrast is the trick to making something feel like there's depth. You see how those stools are darker and the table is lighter? It's giving the illusion that the stool is below, besides it just being underneath, but also below the table, right? So contrast is a neat little trick to create depth. Absolutely important. I also recommend that when you place your stools, that you do this particular feature. One second here and I'll show you. When you pick a stool, make sure that you go and you select this option right here and it's going to be right here, the randomized rotation because you don't want the grain of either your tables or your stools to be facing the same way. Now, if you look at the stamp options on the left and you see how the grain is going vertical, it's going up and down, that's what that means when I say grain, okay? When you look at the tables and you see those striations on the tables, those planks, that's called the grain, okay? You do not want the grain to all be facing in the exact same direction. So do the random rotation for your stools plus some of your tables. When it comes to that oval table, that might not work for you, but those circular tables, you absolutely want to use that random rotation because again, you just don't want the grain all facing in the same direction. That's way too much symmetry, way too weird looking, doesn't look right. Now, once you've added that, then we want to start putting some other things together. We maybe want to put the pantry together. We want to put those other things and then we'll start decorating the tables, but let's just get the rooms each room populated with the largest stuff. So let's take the kitchen, for instance. Let's open that up. Let's take a close look at the kitchen here. Now some of these, what's really nice about these new shelves, look in this top, upper part right here, these shelves right here, they have a bunch of stuff on them already. Oh, now you don't have to put all this stuff on top of these, these counters and these, uh, whatever those are, benches, or I forgot what they're called already, shelving. That's what's so nice about the bar shelving is they already have stuff on them. That's just so, that's just less work for you, okay? You don't want to have to put all the little tiny trinkets, all your bits and bobs all onto the shelves when you can just have a shelf with everything on it. So absolutely perfect, right? You're also going to need a couple other things. Let's go ahead and open up the bar as well because it just looks like those mugs are just kind of hanging out there. <laughs> <laughs> right? So there you go. So <clears throat> now let's take a closer look at the kitchen and look at these elements. The things you're going to need in a kitchen, especially from a tavern, is you're going to need a fireplace, a place where you're going to cook. That's where that oven's going to be. You're going to need a place to cut the food. You see there's a bench in the center with shelving in the center so that if once you're done cooking the food, you can put it on that shelf and whoever's running the front counter can pull it right off the shelf and hand it right over to the bar, which is on that left. Okay, perfect. All right, and you're also gonna notice that there are two giant um, barrels right there of beer right underneath, so that's perfect. You're also gonna notice that there's a washing station. Check out that washing station. You've got the beer right here. You've got the hanging mugs. You know, you always need extra mugs. You never know how many patrons are gonna bring their friends, right? <laughs> All right, now let's also do that pantry, of course. Let's go over here. Let's turn on the pantry. Let me find where that pantry is. Where are you? There you are, pantry. All right, again, those shelves have a bunch of stuff on it already. Perfect. And remember that flow of traffic? Notice very carefully that there's enough room for players to walk through and get access to those shelves. You do not want to put shelves in the center of the room. Otherwise, how are your players, how are you gonna walk around, right? Otherwise, you're just gonna make a mess. So make sure, again, always think about flow of traffic. You can just take a path or whatever, it's up to you, how you wanna go about doing that. Let's go ahead and take care of the privy as well. So there's a privy right here. Let's go ahead and find that privy. Now, where'd you go, privy? I'ma find you. 
Where'd you go? Is it in here somewhere? Oh, I accidentally labeled it a garter robe, but it's actually a privy. A garter robe is specific to a castle. Okay. And I've also done some things outside as well. Notice that there are two privies because, hey, you don't want to show up to a bar where there's a lot of patrons and someone's already in the privy. So two privies are just about right. It's perfect. So two privies. You're going to notice here that there's also a box where the poo goes and you'll see a barrel, a wheelbarrow out there. And that's so that Whoever is the barkeep or the owner, whoever is running that show, is going to go out and be able to clean those, clean those out. Because you don't want that smell just woo, drifting out into the dining hall. Whew, that's just going to scare away patrons, you know? Because you'd be surprised what people can eat and what comes kind of out. It's a scary thing, let me tell you. Okay, let's now let's go on. Let's go ahead and add some extra stuff outside. I just want you to know that you don't always have to portray the things that are outside. For you, it's up to you if you want just the outside to be pure black and focus on the interior, or if you want to have an outside space. I'm throwing in an, out, an outside space because I want to have maybe a garden, some garden spaces. So let me go ahead and check this out. Where's my garden at here? There it is. So you've this, got this garden right here. And the garden is because, hey, you're going to need to grow the food that you need to make the meals and so and of course the access to that garden is of course right through the kitchen so you just go right through the kitchen there you go and there's the garden space that you need to get to the food bring it in cook it boil it whatever it is you need to do right so having access to the garden straight from the kitchen makes sense remember proximity of rooms is determined by the function of the room technically a garden is not a room but the kitchen is a room and its function is similar to the function of the garden, right? It's the food that you need to cook. So of course you have to have access. Now let's keep going and do some more stuff here. Let's go ahead and open up maybe a bar area right in front. And we've got some spilt mugs. We've got a spilt a flask here, a horn. We've got a, a bucket or a crate full of empty mugs. Okay, and you'll notice that there is an entrance to get into from the kitchen into the dining hall. So they have to just lift up that trap door or lift up that little door right there that's at the bar. And then they can just turn around a little bit and then get those mugs and then move them over to, of course, to the washing station. And then when they're all done, you can hang them up here, here, or if the dishes, there's a dish rack right here. All right. Let's keep going. Now let's talk about adding a couple more sections here. Let's talk about the fireplace section. What's gonna be in front of the fireplace? Some seats so people can stay warm. Remember, there's no central heating. So the fireplace is the central place where you're gonna get, stay nice and warm, right? So it only makes sense to have some seating right next to that fireplace because on those really cold nights, you have some place to stay nice and warm. Let's go throw in some garland as well because it's the holiday season. Let's just say that this is also, they're celebrating the holiday season. So we'll throw in some garland from our seasonal stuff. So they've got some garland hanging here. Okay. Let's go ahead and talk about uh, decorating individual tables. And the way that I decorate individual tables is... It's not complex. Details is really determined by the story that you're trying to tell. Me personally, I want each table to tell a story. And the way that I'm doing that is I'm going to take a class from D&D &D and apply each class to that table. So there'll be like a rogues table. There's going to be like a dwarf table. There's going to be a mages table. And it all makes sense because we have those stamps. And so that way, each table has its own little story and that's great for you as a dm because then you can decide the story that you want to tell because you don't know what's going on in the campaign right do i want my players to bump into a mysterious stranger in the corner who's hidden in the dark smoking a pipe and they ha and you have questions for them is it a group of mages who've lost an important scroll and you have to meet them at this tavern so lots of different things. Boom. Nailed it. Turtle powers. First time chatter. You got it. I like that. You recognize the imagery. Boy, you are on top of it, my friend. <laughs> All power to you. <laughs> All right. So let's start with that first table. Let's do a dwarves table. Okay. And what I've done to the dwarves table is I've added some axes. 
and I've thrown in some mugs as well. And so that way, you know what kind of, I mean, it could also be a barbarian's table as well, but for now, we're just going to call it a dwarf. And you can add whatever materials that you want. You can add a, let's just say that these, these dwarves were having a drinking contest and you can just cover that table in tons and tons of mugs. You can have a dwarf laying on the floor with puke throwing, coming out of their mouth. Whatever you want. Okay. Maybe you're there for some relaxation and having that beer drinking contest with the dwarves. You're trying to find out who can drink the most beer before you get to the privy and the privy is not too far away right it's just right up there so whatever you think might be best that it's up to you okay let's check out that rogues table when i think of a rogue i think of you know incognito assassin like so a lot of daggers and just put some lights down but you can throw down a lot of things if you want maybe your rogues wear masks maybe there's a hideous disfiguration with one of your characters or your players Maybe they just want their identity to remain secret. So you can throw down masks. You can throw down a bow, an arrow if you want. It's whatever you feel is necessary is going to portray what's happening. There's some daggers sticking into the table, right? So whatever it is, the theme that you're going for with that table, look for those stamps in the catalog and then just start placing them down, okay? Let's do also a barbarian's table. And with the barbarian's table, I put down just a bunch of blunt, large, weapons what i would expect from a barbarian some flasks some beer mugs empty mugs it's big old got a couple maces there but you could throw down whatever you wanted maybe there's been some arm wrestling um some arm wrestling contest between these barbarians you could use an explosion mark put it on the table to make it look like one barbarian beat another with explosive force in an arm wrestling contest Whatever you think is best, be creative, use your imagination. There's so many different things that you can do. Let's keep adding in some more tables. Let's do a mages table. And I think that mages table is down here in the corner. And you see there's a lot on the mages table. You've got some scrolls. You've got some staves. You've got a magnifying glass so that you can look at the paper to see what you're looking at. So a lot of different things that you can do. Remember, we have a wizard pack, so you can take stuff from the wizard pack and put it down on that table. So a lot of different things that you can do. So decorating is not too complex, at least not for a tavern. You just need to look at each table and decide the theme of each table that you want. Let's go with another one. Let's do the stranger's corner, Aragorn, shall we say. So maybe you have a stranger in the corner right here. They've got their shoes off. There's a scroll next to them. They're kind of hidden into the dark crevices where the light of the fireplace can't reach. And they're puffing away and doing these questions and things like this. So it's always nice to have a little dark corner somewhere in your tavern to where maybe you want to meet up with a shadowy figure that's got a mission for you and your players, right? So we got that stranger's corner. Let's also do the gambler's table. And I'm going to, and you can tell it's a gambler's table because you've got some playing cards here. You got some coins because that's going to be your pot, right? Whenever you're playing maybe poker or whatever game in your fantasy world, the pot is the amount of money that you're putting to bet against the other players. Whoever wins that game is going to win that pot. So the gambler's table makes sense. Maybe you're here for an infamous card game that takes place every year amongst the greatest players. And that's that's the start of your campaign is this incredibly secretive but lucrative um, gambling or this game that takes place. Okay, so a lot of different options that you can choose from. So just be creative. Let's go ahead and also decorate the main table. So the, the main table is this big long table right here. Okay, let's go ahead and decorate that main table. It doesn't have a particular theme because it's a table for everyone. It's where everyone can sit. So if mages can sit with dwarves, can sit with assassins, can sit with rogues, whatever it might be, this table is for everyone. It's a nice, large table where we can all come together, eat our food without bias, and just enjoy ourselves, right? Unless you want the bias because that just makes it for way more adventure, right? <laughs> so totally up for you. Yes, where the that's the table for you where the food is. Yeah, you hook me up. Wherever the food is, that's where I'm going, okay? <laughs> okay, let's take a look and see what other things that I need to add in here. I think I've added in the entrance. I've added in the rugs. Oh, let's add in the chopped logs. 
and that's going to be over by the fireplace. So if I go down this way, you'll notice that there are some chopped logs right here and as well as an axe. That's going to be because, hey, whoever's sitting by the fire is going to be nursing that fire, chopping some, some kindling, going, and going to put some logs into the fire to keep it nice and warm. And let's also throw in a, a piano because, hey, every bar, every tavern needs a little bit of music. So let's throw down a nice piano there. It's next to the next to the fireplace. You're not going to be freezing cold playing. You'll stay nice and warm. And it's, it's also got some garland on there for the holiday season. And that last table, I believe, is the bard's table. So let me just see if I can find the bard's table. Oh, excuse me. And you can tell it's the bard's table because there's instruments all over it, right? You've got that. I'm not sure that's not technically a guitar, but it is labeled that, but we'll just say guitar for the heck of it. And there's a violin there. It's very clear that who's sitting at this table is some bards, right? They're the ones that are playing some music. Maybe this ta tavern has a permanent room dedicated to the bard who lives at this tavern, right? And maybe the barkeep pays them to sw sing sweet songs to say sonnets, to tell stories, to keep the patrons engaged and to keep them in there to get more money. Okay, so it's always good to have maybe a local bard that hangs out at the tavern and kind of allows for entertainment and storytelling, right? Always important to have that. Now, after you've put everything down, you notice that I've got these candles, but no light sources. So what I like to do is to throw down some lighting as well. Okay, and so the lighting... So I, what I now the way that I do lighting is very simple. I use two light sources when I do this. Let me type in light and I'll show you because the secret to good lighting is to have that warm natural feeling that a candle has. So if I type in light real quick, what I like to do is to take a small orange light, make it small and then put it right over the light source which is going to be a candle and then i run over to this other light source right here just called lights and i use a larger circular one and i drop the opacity a little bit and then i put that on top so you'll notice that there's a little bit of an orange glow right that's that orange light now when you have a cluster of of candles together you only have to use one of those orange lights and just put that right in the center of those candles and then use that larger light at a lower opacity, that different one that's not pure orange, it's a little more yellow, and then put that on top of that. And that's gonna give you that nice, warm glow feeling that you're looking for. And we're also gonna be using um, filters to help to augment and to help push out some of those light sources as well later in the stream. Let's take a step back. What I always like to do after I finish working on a room is I like to step back and just take a look at everything as a whole just to see how it looks all right now you'll also notice that there's some lights sticking out from the windows as well so the lights projecting from the inside going out of that window it's just to give it a little bit more feel to it right so it looks kind of nice now I'm gonna select everything here just in case I didn't miss anything there we go I did miss something I missed that entrance now the entrance which is also referred to as maybe it could be referred to as a parlor. It could be referred to as a vestibule, but it's basically the entrance way where maybe uh, the, the tavern owner says, hey, you have to store your weapons at the front. All right, no weapons allowed. Now, if you notice, there's weapons all over the place. So this bartender or this barkeep is a little lax on the rules, but let's just say that you have rules like, hey, no weapons beyond the entranceway. You've got some racks on the side to put your weapons. And then you obviously have a bench there for maybe for sitting or for people to place their bags if they don't want to take them with to their table or place their belongings, whatever it is you want. It's up to you. So totally up to you. All right. Now that we finished this floor, let's go move on to the next floor. Everything's been done. So let's go move on to that first floor. Now, when I click that floor, you'll notice, remember what I said? There's an opening that looks down. So when you're walking through the hallway and where these banisters are, you can see the ground floor. And you can, you know, I don't know, maybe shoot a snot rocket at somebody, make a paper airplane, hit it at somebody, play a practical joke to maybe one of the barbarians sitting at the end of the table, maybe throw a rock at them, just tease them a little bit, right? But you have that open space right there. Remember, it's open to allow, <laughs> gross, totally gross, right? Only I would come up with that. But it's got that open opening so that you can look down. And again, remember, it's function. 
Its aesthetics is it looks cool, but its function is, is that heat will rise up and warm up that, that first floor, right? So perfect. All right. Now let's take a look at the rooms. Now remember what we talked about. Look carefully too. I have these pop-outs where the roof is. You see here are the pop-outs for the roof, right? And don't forget we also have the fireplaces as well. That's perfect, right? And then here's the roof for the privy. All right, so you have that nice roof there. Now let's look carefully at the overall floor plan. Remember, this goes down into the dining hall. Going up takes you into the hallway, and then it stops right here against the wall. Okay, so that wrap around hallway. And of course, the hallway has access to every single room. So access to that room, this room, this room. All these rooms have access from the hallway. Okay, remember, you don't want to obstruct access to each room. You have to implement a design that's going to have a hallway that's going to lead to each room. Because if you don't, you're going to have to travel through three different people's rooms to get to your room. So a, that's what a hallway is for. It's to allow for other room access to all these rooms without barging in on anybody doing their business, whatever that may be, okay? All right, now just like before, when it comes to setting up a room, what I like to do is to just start with the mo the largest thing in the room, which is gonna be a bed, right? A bed and a rug. So let's go open up and we'll just do one room at a time. Now remember, we're gonna keep some continuity. Remember we had a bard's table, a barbarian's table. Remember how we had all that? Well, each one of those rooms is gonna correlate to those tables as well. So there's gonna be a bard's room, a barbarian's room, there's going to be a mage's room and maybe some other rooms as well with some people that you don't know about, right? So let's go ahead and go ahead, open this up. We'll go into objects and we're going to start with the chandelier first, okay? So sh these chandeliers hang from the ceiling and then hang just above the opening so that you have more lighting and maybe just a little bit more heat, okay? So these chandeliers are hanging down in that space right there. So that's gonna light up the upper floor. It's gonna light up the entire hallway so you're not stumbling around in the dark, right? So that overhanging light source allows you to see where you're going in the hallway. Let's also decorate the hallway space. So I've put what's called a runner, a rug that runs all the way around the hallway. So they got this rug that runs all the way around it. I've, used, I've put some garland as well for the holiday season on some of the walls so that the hallway is decorated for the holiday season. You'll even see that the banisters also have garland and some bows there. So you have some nice decorated banisters. If you're not sure what a banister is, it's basically like the railing that goes around a staircase or can go around an opening like this, okay? And then there's obviously a Christmas tree right here in this little space that I've got right here because it's just a little open space right there, a little Christmas tree so that you, we have a little bit more decoration. Stick with that theme, okay? Now, once we've done that room, we can start moving on to other rooms. So let's go with the stranger's room. Remember that Aragon-esque Aragon we were talking about? And this room is kind of dark. You notice that there's some masks in there. I'm trying to implicate that this person is a stranger. They're an unknown. We don't know who this person is. Maybe they have nefarious, maybe they have a nefarious purpose. Who knows, right? But I've thrown in a couple things. There's a shovel in there. Hmm, why is there a shovel? Do they know about some particular secret room? I don't know. Why is there no light in that room? Why are there masks, right? So that stranger's room asks some questions. Why is it so dark in this room? Why is there a shovel in there, right? Let's also do the lover's room, all right? The lover's room is, well, as you guessed it, where the lovers like to sleep, right? It's a room with a double bed that allows for two people to sleep in, while these extra other rooms might only have one single or two singles. So this is the lover's room. This is where the lovers stay. Maybe one of the lovers was murdered in the middle of the night, and that's why you're at this tavern to solve that mystery. Who knows, right? So each room's gonna tell a little bit of a story just like those tables. Let's obviously do the bard's room, okay? Well, actually, let's also do uh, the barkeep's room real quick. 
I should have done that one first, but the bar keeps room is going to be the largest room or the bar owner. It's going to be the largest room and it's going to have that double bed for whoever the owner is and their partner. It's going to have a bit, a bit of a table there, some cabinets. You can throw in some rugs if you want. Light sources up to you. And to the chagrin, unfortunately to the chagrin of the bar owner, the bard's, the bard's room is right next to them because <laughs> That bar keeps not going to get much sleep. Those bards stay up way too late. Hey, you know what? Maybe cut the bards off after three drinks because, hey, I got to sleep, guys. I got to get some sleep. So unfortunately, to the chagrin of the barkeep, the bard's room is right next to the, right next to uh, the barkeep or the owner, all right? And you'll notice the way that I decorated it with the bard's room. There's instruments in there just like there were instruments on the bard's table, right? All right, let's keep throwing in some more rooms. Let's do the dwarves room. I'm gonna go into this corner right here. Let's turn that on. Just like before, you've thrown in an ax. We've got a war hammer here. We've got some mugs with beer. So it's nice to have there, or they pass out, absolutely. So you got some room there for that. Let's also do the rogues room. Let me see where that rogues room is. I think it's up here. Here's the rogues room. Just like before, I'm sticking with the same kind of motif. There are some daggers in there. Maybe there's just one rogue that's staying the night instead of all of them. So just one room. And notice that I'm using different types of beds to look carefully at the bed usage. I'm not using the same bed in every single room. I absolutely recommend that you do multiple, multiple beds when you're decorating each room. So that way there's not all these different types of not this is, so there's not using the same bed for every single room. Okay, that's just gonna look really weird and I don't recommend that. Let's obviously do the gambler's room as well. And I didn't put much in the gambler's room. Sometimes it's nice to have a room that doesn't have much going on at all. So I just kind of left this room fairly plain and I do recommend a couple empty rooms as well. So we have some empty rooms. There's nothing going on inside of them. It's always nice to have some vacancy because this way maybe there's something special going on or maybe there's a, a new NPC that's being introduced and you want to have that spare room for them to get to. So having some empty rooms is a good idea. Not every single room has to be densely populated with stamps. It's okay to give your eye a rest, give the players a rest from looking at all the different details in all the rooms. Having some room that's empty just for them to explore and to go and look into the cabinet to find things. Not everything that's important is going to be visible to the eye. So just having some empty rooms where they have to look inside of a cabinet, look inside of a box or a chest, or look underneath a table is a way that you can determine like, oh, hey, there's not much in this room. But hey, there could be something hiding somewhere, right? So having a few rooms that are empty is kind of nice. Let's obviously throw in a mage's room as well. And I'm going to have access to the roof from this room. You can tell it's a mage's room because look, you've got some, you've got some staff in here. You've got some scrolls, a book. There's even a chalked out summoning circle on the floor. This is very clearly going to be a mage's room. Now I'm going to go ahead and select everything here and make sure that I've, I didn't miss anything else which is the light sources. That last thing you add is those light sources. Remember how I taught you how to do that? Use that orange light and then use a, a yellow light on top of that because you really want to have that nice warm feel to it, right? Now the way to access to the roof is through that mage's room. Remember we talked about that? See that ladder right there? Me personally, I love roof battles. I love roof battles. It's so much fun. You can push your enemies off the roof, roof and watch them fall to their death. Maybe there's a carrier pigeon up there who's stuck up there and just won't come down. You, there's a special message you have to get. Uh, maybe there's um, some mages hanging out up there. Who knows? Maybe there's a firework display going on. Whatever it is, a roof is so much fun. I personally love roof battles. I also like just traveling around and exploring the roof. It's a lot of fun to do that, right? So let's go ahead and hit up that roof section real quick. And we're actually running out of time. This might go over an hour, so I apologize, but I'll try to wrap it up as quick as possible. Let's go ahead and throw down that roof. Okay, so now you have also have that roof space as well. Okay, and there's access to each pop out with staircase with a ladder that goes down. And the reason why is because hey, you might need to actually get to what's called the 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 chimney 
So right here, you have the chimney right here, and you're going to want to have access because you might have to clean it out. So I've added this stair, added this ladder right here, so you'll have access to the pop out to where the chimney is, right? And there's access to this chimney so that you, that people can go and clean it out. Maybe maybe you're doing some side errands for some money, right? Maybe the barkeep has asked you, "Hey, my flues are filthy. My chimney is filthy. Maybe there's something stuck." in the chimney and you discover something magical. Who knows, right? There's a lot of different things that you can do with the roof. Be imaginative, figure out what your players might be interested in. Now there's a couple other things on the roof that I've added here. I've added a nest up top. Remember maybe a carrier pigeon has made a home there and there's this message you have to get to. Maybe the chimney is a mimic. <laughs> I love that, right? I've also added a couple other elements on the roof as well. This right here is what's called uh, a cupola. Okay, and a cupola is basically a piece that pops out from the roof and kind of allows for ventilation. That's the main purpose of a cupola is basically ventilation. So I've created this cupola on top of the roof as well. And of course, there's access to the top of the cupola as well. And you'll see that a, I've made a makeshift weather vane right here as well. Maybe it's a magical weather vane. Who knows, right? Maybe the weather vane doesn't predict the weather. Maybe it does something else, right? Who knows? So be creative when you're kind of putting everything together, right? Now I'm going to go ahead and start with that last room. Oh, real quick, just so I can help you out with roofs, because I know roofs can be confusing. When you're putting together your roof piece, just make the main body first. Remember how I made the main room, that dining hall first? Same thing with the roof pieces. Make the largest part of the roof first. Once you've put them together, pick one side to be darker than the other, okay? Notice how this section of the roof is darker than the one on the, the bottom. It's because it's meant to show shadow and depth. If those roof pieces are the same color on both sides, it's going to look really flat. So taking one side and making them darker is really helpful. Notice too that this cupola has a darker side to it. Notice that these pop-outs roofs are a little bit darker as well to show that they're further down. Remember the trick to, the trick to depth is always going to be contrast. That's the trick. Contrast is the trick. Okay, now that we've done all that, let's go to that last room, which is going to be the cellar. So let me turn off the first and the ground floor. We're no longer using them. We don't need them anymore. Let's get rid of the roof as well. We'll turn that roof off. Let's go into that cellar. Okay, I'm going to turn the cellar on. Now, there's supposed to be clipping masks with the cellar, but when it comes to clipping masks, a little secret here, if you, even if you turn the opacity all the way to zero on clipping masks, that doesn't turn them off. You have to use a toggle to turn them off. So if I open up the cellar and I've got a group called clipping masks. Now, whenever you open up a group and you open it for the first time, every single object within that group is going to be selected. That's extremely helpful if the group is nothing but one object. So it's this is nothing but clipping masks. Now, if I go over into the left panel, you'll notice that there's the stamp options and there's a clipping mask toggle. When I turn it on and off, you'll notice that it's going to pick up whatever I've painted on the FG layer. Okay, clipping masks pick up whatever's on the FG layer. The FG layer is anything made with the add mode of the mask tool. So technically, a clipping mask is a movable FG layer. That's basically what a clipping mask is. And they have a lot of different functions. You can hide things, all kinds of stuff with clipping masks. So very useful. Let's take a look at what we've got here. Now, remember that original floor plan we talked about? We've got the access from the kitchen to go into the cellar, right? We've also got our buttery right here. Remember what a buttery is? That's gonna be our storage for beer. And then we're gonna have our grain in this room right here. And of course, our secret room is gonna be right here. And who knows what lurks in the dark of a secret room, okay? Who knows, right? So let's go ahead and open up. Let's do some objects here and let's get started on this. Let's see here, I'll start on objects. Let's start first with our buttery, okay? Now with a buttery, it's not too complex. I just took some shelving, 
some empty shelving and then I just put some barrels on top of that because this is where you're going to get your beer or your butts. It's a buttery, right? That's where you go to get your butts, right? No, no, no. Okay. The buttery is where you get your beer. All right. And remember, this is where you're going to get this is this could be some action in a cellar, right? Cellars are kind of fun. Who knows what's lurking down there? So you've got that buttery. And then don't forget the grain storage as well. So the grain storage is probably going to have like bags of wheat or whatever. And of course, we're going to need access to get to the secret room. So let me go open that up. Now I've sticked with this particular type of theme. Remember, we're doing these uh, weekly weekly map prompts and this week's map prompt is uh, dragon's rest and so what i've done is i've created a what happened was is a baby drag they found the barkeep when they originally decided to dig the foundations and create the bar they discovered the remains of a baby dragon okay and let's just say that in this world the one that i've created a baby dragon is good luck okay it's what's gonna the bar Keep knows this, and so they're going to be using that good luck to make sure that their business, that their tavern does really, really well. Okay, maybe it turns for a darker side. Maybe blood sacrifices are needed for the good luck to happen. Who knows, right? We've got some blood there. We've got some candles to represent that maybe there's some kind of ritual taking place. You've also got a um, a summoning circle there. Maybe that's where the ritual takes place. You've got a bench with some potions and a scroll. All those things are going to like maybe determine that, hey, there's something ritualistic about this space, right? Remember, our weekly map prop is Dragon's Rest. Got a lot of time left in the week. Go do those, do those weekly map prompts. They're a lot of fun and we're going to be doing them every single week, every single month from here on out. These map prompts are great to really, really bring out the creativity, okay? Let's just talk about real quick one more thing here, just the access to get into the secret room, right? Maybe you have to, uh, maybe one of these, um, maybe one of these bags of wheat is not actually filled with wheat. It's filled with something else, or maybe there's a lever hidden in the bag, and you have to dig your hands through and pull that lever, and it opens it up. You notice that there are some doors right here. So maybe these doors swing open like this. This is representing the swing radius. And then right here, you'll notice that there is a mechanism right here. It's always nice to have some kind of mechanism because the realism is really, really helpful. If you don't have some kind of mechanism, it might look odd. So it it's not just aesthetics. It's also function, all right? Because you've got to figure out, well, how do I get into this secret room, right? And how does it operate? So throwing in that chain mechanism there helps you to figure out, like, how is it that this mechanism for these doors operate? So very, very helpful to throw some kind of mechanism for secret rooms. Also, it also might give a hint to the players, like, oh, hey, I see a mechanism right there. Is there a secret room in here somewhere? So it's kind of helpful to, you know, have a mechanism or part of a mechanism be visible within the viewers of the player's view so that they can see, <clears throat> what is that annoying noise? Um, so they can see what they're doing. Now, I've also used what's called this dry grass right here. This dry grass works perfect to show a little bit of dirt. You know that when you're walking around somewhere, you're when you're, all the dirt that's on your boot kind of, just falls off and falls onto that floor. And so throwing down that dry grass at a lower opacity kind of makes it look like there's been traffic going through. Your floor, if it's absolutely pristine and clean, it doesn't look like there's been any traffic walking around on your floors. So that dry grass is a great texture at a low opacity to represent flow, traffic, wear and tear, that there's been stuff. And I've made it a little bit, um, I've also used it at a higher opacity to represent little pieces of grain. Those will look kind of big, but I just wanted to be able to see it. So that dry grass almost looks like grain, like maybe one of the grain bags broke open. Maybe that's a clue for your player, like, oh, hey, the, this bag is open and grain fell out. Why is that? Put your hand in there, find that lever, and pull. So when you're adding your details, think about how the details are going to tell the story because that's what details are about. It's about telling the story. Otherwise, what's the point, right? Let's just go quickly on the overview here. 
Uh, one thing also about sellers real quick is, is that you can just make the whole thing black. And all I did was just fill in this entire section outside of the cellar with black rugs, circular and square, so that, that I could have multiple floors. So when I turn off this, let me also turn off the clipping mask too, by the way, real quick. We don't want those on. So let me select all the clipping masks, turn them off. There we go, perfect. See what happens when you turn the clipping masks off? Okay, let me go back over to the cellar. Let's turn the cellar off. And I mentioned about making stackable floors. For the time being, you're gonna to have to use a stamp to represent the floor, but I wanna show you how I did this because making stackable floors is really important because like I said before in the beginning of the stream, it might be really, really difficult to find the room to put the room on the canvas to put all your rooms. You might not have enough space. Stackable floors is the way that you would fix that problem. Because remember, resizing the map, what happens is it doesn't actually resize the canvas. It changes the aspect ratio and drops the scale of the stamps. To avoid that problem, if you consider that a problem, this depends on how big your scale is. If your scale is really small, resizing is not the option for you. Instead, go ahead and start with the floor. So let me go back to that first floor real quick and I'll show you how I did that. All I did was I took what's called the stairs. If you go ahead and open up stairs in the catalog, so if I type in stairs, well, not light stairs, that's not gonna work, right? If I type in stairs, you'll notice that each staircase, let's just expand all these real quick. You notice that each staircase has what's called a landing. So this basalt stairs has a landing. There's a landing for these desert stairs. There's a landing for these sewer clay stairs. There's landing for this log cabin stairs. You can take these like this and then just start putting them, piecing them together, just copy and paste. What I like to do is just make a group of four of them like this, put four of them together like this. And you can also drop the contrast. If you don't like the dark, wood those dark lines you can drop the contrast a little bit to remove them if you wish and just boost up the brightness a little bit and then just stack those put them beneath put them beneath the walls and then just put them all along all the way across so what i did is i just went like this this right here is four of those pieces just copy paste these together like this to create your floor. And so that way, when you group the entire floor and it's grouped and labeled, when you brought the opacity to zero, the entire floor and everything on it will disappear. So that's how you make stackable floors is that you can't, you cannot use the mask tool to make your floors. You have to use a stamp because if you just use the mask tool, whatever texture you've painted on the ground floor is going to show up on the first floor. So you absolutely want to use a stamp to make your floor. And you can use whatever stamps you want. But I use these, I use these staircase landings because they've got the texture that I need and they work out just fine. They work perfectly. Okay. So that's how you make your stackable floors. Okay. It's just your stackable floor is just to make sure that your floor is made of an object and not the mask tool. Because again, whatever texture is on the FG or BG layer, that's going to show no matter what floor you have. It has to be an object. Okay. So that's the one trick about stackable floors. All right. Well, that concludes the stream. Thank you so much. I hope this helped. Just remember all those things I taught you about. Start with the largest room first and then put some pop outs and then start once you've made the walls and putting all the rooms together once you start to populate the room start with the largest stamps first beds tables benches whatever you start with those first and that way the most of the work is done for you because what happens is, is that when you first start you'll be like well wait a minute i have so much left to do if you start with the larger objects first then you'll have your flow of traffic then you'll also be able to start decorating things and it just happens a lot quicker when you use this order of operation largest to smallest details are small they go last right big objects go first Okay, don't start small and then go big because it'll take you longer, right? If you have start with the bigger objects first, most of the space has been filled in and then you can start adding in the details. And of course, when you throw in your details, think about a story, okay? You want a story to be told, okay? All right, well, hey, 
that's it. I'm going to go ahead and jump out of here and we're going to go look at the calendar for what the, the rest of the streams are for the rest of the month and then we'll get out of here. So the next one is going to be um, how to create, oh, wait a minute, that's November. What I want is December. My mistake. Let me go to feed real quick. Check my calendar. Here we go. All right. Now we just finished taverns on the 14th today. So the 21st next week is how to create ambushes. When it comes to ambushes, I'm going to be doing things like where to have them, how to set them up, how many different kinds of ambushes that you can have, how to um, have a balanced battle so that all your players feel like they have um, a role to play, that they all feel like they have a victorious role to play in the battle. So balanced battles are really important. And to also make a challenge for your players, right? Because it's no fun if your players can win a battle in a matter of moves. You want to create challenges for your players. Ambushes are a great, great way to create balanced and uh, difficult battles, combat, but different difficult combat for your players. And then the last stream of the week, it's going to be on the 28th, and we're going to show you how to make watermills. Okay, because watermills are always nice to have. They're an interesting little element. They're a great story element. They're aesthetically pleasing and they're cool. And I usually put some in my campaigns when I'm doing them. Okay, so that's what's going on for next for the next couple of weeks. Now, if you have any suggestions for future streams, go join our Discord server. Make sure you go to the roles channel and then get the incarnator rule because you won't be able to see all the channels in the server unless you get that incarnator rule. Then go over to stream uh, requests and go ahead and just scroll through all the stream requests and see if there's any that interest you. Give those a thumbs up. You don't see what you want to see, go ahead and add it on there, okay? Because we're going to get to as much of the streams as possible. We do these once a week. So there's tons and tons of material to work with and a lot of streams that we're going to be doing. So we're not going to stop. So don't be afraid, make your suggestions, and we will do all that we can. All right, well, that's the end of the stream. Thank you so much. I'll see you all next week for ambushes. Please stay safe and healthy. Merry map making, and I'll see you all soon, okay? Avita Zane, everyone.